Welcome to the next session of the Cloud Exchange. My guest today is Andrew Fairbanks, the General Manager for Federal at IBM Services. Andrew, welcome to the discussion. Pleasure to be here. For this session, we're focusing on how agencies can take more advantage of multi-cloud or hybrid cloud infrastructures. There are few agencies, well, really any organization that isn't putting all their proverbial technology eggs in one basket. As you heard already today and throughout the Cloud Exchange, most agencies are living in this hybrid world. But just because you're in this multi-cloud environment, it doesn't mean you're optimizing the architecture and managing it effectively and efficiently. So for how best to do that, well, let's turn to Andrew Fairbanks from IBM Services. Now, Andrew, we talk a lot about multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. It's one of those terms we get thrown out a lot. Let's maybe start just briefly, what's the definition? When we, when we talk about hybrid cloud, what are we referring to? When we talk about hybrid cloud, I think we get to the same point that you were just on, that federal agencies are reaching a point in their cloud maturity where they have workloads running in their own dedicated data centers and in multiple clouds. And that really is the ideal architecture to get their work done. Uh, they want to maintain their data securely. They want to be able to take advantage of, of mainframe computers where it makes sense. And they want to be able to take advantage of best in class infrastructure and platform as a service. And in order to do that, they need a hybrid cloud architecture that allows them to run those workloads securely and efficiently across the enterprise. And, and we call that hybrid cloud. And the thing about hybrid cloud, and, and you laid it out nicely, is that it's, it's best in class commercial, it's internal data centers, mm -hmm. it's even mainframes, and they all have to talk to each other and interact with each other. And that's where that big challenge comes in of living in this multi-cloud hybrid world. Right. And I think in the first stage, what agencies were doing is sort of running these different elements in silos. So they were running their dedicated data centers and had workloads there. They had discrete workloads in other clouds. What they're getting to now is that they really need to be able to run those workloads across the boundaries. They need to be able to have applications that run in the data, dedicated data center, consuming data from the public cloud, being able to deliver data out to the tactical edge. And in order to do that, they need a common management system so that they have visibility into how those workloads are running across that distributed enterprise. The key piece for me, as you talked about this, is having that ability to manage all those things. Do agencies have that? What are you seeing? What are some of the trends you're seeing around this management of this hybrid cloud setup? When I talk to CIOs and CTOs, I think the one thing they don't feel like they have is that ability to centrally manage the workloads across all of those different environments, or to have one, you know, to use the phrase, single pane of glass, where they can uh, really see where all of their workloads are running, and to be able to orchestrate those in a in a secure in a secure manner. So what we're seeing, I think, it, you see this in the Department of Defense with the the new JWCC follow-on to Jedi, for example. Right, they've moved away from a single cloud model. They're looking for a multi-cloud environment. Uh, and they're also looking within that for the ability to provide centrally managed but distributed workloads that are able to run across that 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 global enterprise. That's where this world is going, um, and and I think that's just one example. We could talk about Jedi all day. <laughs> it's just too bad it just took DoD a little longer to uh, get to that, <laughs> that that point. But we won't put you on the spot there. This idea of orchestration though also plays a role not just around managing the cloud, but for security, for mm -hmm. data, for all the mission stuff that, that, that needs to get done. Let's go down that path a little bit about that orchestration. Let's, first of all, are you defining it in what way, orchestration, and then what does it really mean for agencies and how, how do they do it? Right. So, so what we mean by orchestration is that I think agencies, I, I, the metaphor that works for me is sort of the orchestra and <laughs> sort of the agency CIO or the C, CTO is the conductor, right? And, and you have a pit out there with people wearing Google sweaters and Amazon sweaters and Microsoft sweaters and IBM sweaters and Salesforce sweaters. Um, and, and the real key is how do you create that score and how do you sort of gra grab the baton and kind of create that cadence so that all those different pieces can really work effectively and, and, and play a, a, a symphony that really is in concert um, and, not, um, and not out of tune. Um, and so there are a number of, of sort of tools and techniques that go in, into doing that. I think one of the ones that's really emerging is the container technology, for example. You know, open source containers really provide a mechanism for CIOs and CTOs to take applications and run them anywhere. You can build them once, run them anywhere. And it gives them incredible flexibility to, to surge, to, to take advantage of what the best technology is for a, different, for, for a given context 
so that they get those workloads done. It also allows them to create an overarching security framework that really is needed in this kind of world where things are crossing boundaries, right? Encryption in motion, encryption at rest, uh, the, the overall governance of how workloads flow. Um, it, it allows them to minimize how data moves, right? So, so one of the really nice things about hybrid cloud is it actually allows you to keep your data resident where it exists in the most secure environment and then to consume that piece that you need for a given transaction. Those are the kinds of things that we mean when we talk about orchestration. You bring up containers, of course, you have to bring up IBM, it's bought Red Hat, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that they're, they're known for their, for their containers. And I think the containers also help out in the sense of when you put a workload in, the, in, in one cloud, you may realize, okay, that may not have been the best cloud for it, it's easy to move to another cloud. And I think that's what DoD and other agencies are really starting to understand is, there's certain clouds good for certain workloads, and, and ensuring that you're in the right one is the first step. And then the second step, if you're not in the right one, easily move to a new, uh, new cloud, a different cloud infrastructure. Are you finding that that's where that hybrid cloud also pays off is by having these different ones, you can, you can optimize, if you will, for, 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 to buzz that up a little bit? Yeah. When I talk to CIOs and CTOs on this topic, I think they really like the open container technology for, for two reasons. One is they really want to avoid vendor lock. They want to be able to have that, that competition uh, to make sure that they are able to secure the best environment for a given workload, run the right workload in the right place at the right time. And containers gives them, an open source gives them that flexibility um, to do it. I think the other reason is what you talk about, is different environments really are um, purpose built for different kinds of workloads. Um, you know, mainframes are generally regarded as the best, the best environment for running high volume transaction, really data intensive workloads. High performance computing is really important for, for workloads that require enormous you know, amounts of calculations in a very short period of, of time. Um, distributed clouds are, are sort of the best transaction, are the best and most cost effective way of delivering um, more, more citizen facing kinds of transactions. They want the flexibility to be able to put the workload in the environment that's best, uh, best tailored for that, for that need. And open source containers allows them to take advantage of that richness um, in, a, in a way that I think helps them do their jobs more effectively. And you're right, we ended up buying Red Hat because we saw that architectural trend. It was a reaction to what we were hearing from CIOs and CTOs in terms of the kind of architectural environment they wanted in the future. Um, and, and we believe that Red Hat you know, provides that framework. Do you, the trends that have gone on over the last few old decade, when, as agencies have mo moved more and more to the cloud, become more comfortable with the cloud, are, is that one of the bigger trends is that they're understanding which workloads belong in which clouds, which need to stay in the data center, which need to run in between? Is that the biggest place where you've seen the, the learning happen? The, the learning I've seen is that, that agencies are just becoming more comfortable with the fact that cloud is a viable solution for them. I think 10 years ago, the real question was, can my data be secure? Can, can, can I trust that the workloads will be, will be run effectively if they're not sort of within the boundaries of my data center? I think most agencies passed across that bridge about 10 years ago. I think they then went through a phase in the maturity where they realized that, you know what, this one cloud doesn't meet all my needs. I also want to be able to access uh, certain applications over in Salesforce. I want to be able to offer certain transactions over in a workday. Um, and, and, and they had to then cross the bridge of, okay, now I'm going to run workloads in multiple environments. I think the bridge they're facing now is they're realizing that with these workloads out there in these multiple environments, they want to be able to come back and centrally manage these and to actually be able to run workloads that cut across those boundaries, right? Where you're actually, to actually execute a workflow, you may actually be consuming data or performing, performing pieces of that workflow in three different clouds. Right? That's the next bridge to follow in terms of where the leading organizations are, are driving, driving business value. So if we look, go back to your analogy of the symphony and the orchestration, mm -hmm. we had uh, uh, Fugit in, in A minor, and now we're in the B major, and now we're in the C phase, right? Yeah. Or, 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 <laughs> I may have messed that up, I'm not good with music. Or the yeah. one I think about is you probably started with a string quartet, okay. and then you realized you wanted a, a horn section, and now you got the percussion coming in. Um, but 
you know, for that to really be a compelling piece of music, you know, they, they need to be playing off the same score. And I think that, that's really where the CIOs and CTOs are at right now. So let's talk, go down that path a little bit and understand how do you play off the same score? What are some of the ways to centrally manage this multi-cloud solution? And, and, and what are some of the challenges, pitfalls? Walk, walk me through it. I think one of the nice things about the, the cloud environment is that they actually are quite interoperable, right? They, they run off of, of common standards, common sort of API frameworks, um, common ways of integrating you know, container technology allows workloads that run in one cloud to burst in, into other clouds. Um, so, so there's an ability to sort of run those, those workloads. And I think that in some ways provides the score that we're talking about, right? When, when you have sort of a shared set of standards in t terms of how data tra get, gets transferred, how jobs get, get run, um, when you have an accepted sort of container-based technology that allows an application to, to, to self-populate the, the compute, the storage, the network it needs within AWS, within Microsoft, within IBM, it, it actually provides that score that, that all those musicians can play off of. It's interesting you bring up the common framework piece. I think, it, I think a lot of maybe agencies don't quite understand that. Maybe even some of your private sector companies, the customers don't understand that, that there's a kind of, the cloud providers have Agreed, maybe is not the right word, but at least the the, the path is is not so wide that that you know there's so not not so many forks in the road. Is that the key here? Is that that the, that the underlying infrastructure is is making this multi cloud possible? That it's making it. I'm not sure easy is the right word, but at least doable. I think I think in part right. So so I do think for for much of what we're talking about in terms of the ability of sort of containers to be able to sort of software-defined network, software-defined storage, there, there are those abilities to burst into those infrastructures as a service or into those platforms as a service and develop once and run anywhere. Now, I don't think we're in a perfect state. I think some of the cloud service providers still have proprietary services, services that can only run in their environments, and I think there are some different schools of thought that each of the cloud services providers have, have used in creating their own business strategies. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that the open approach is the right approach um, from a client-centric perspective, right? If I think about it, and we try to do our architectural design from a, a very client-centric space. If I'm the CIO or the CTO, what kind of flexibility do I want? What kinds of services do I want access to? And how can I optimize their ability to run their enterprise using both our infrastructure and Amazon's infrastructure and Microsoft's infrastructure. We want to unleash the power of all of that capability uh, for our clients because that's what we think they need to be able to run their missions. And they have really important missions for our country. You know, it's, we're talking about national defense. We're talking about homeland security. Um, we, we want those leaders to be able to take advantage of the best of the industry, whether it's IBM technology or whether it's any of those other companies I just mentioned. There's amazing capability out there and CIOs and, and, and leaders should have access to all of it. The open approach is, becomes even more important when you talk about your data and then you're talking about critical, critical infrastructure and protection of it. Mm -hmm. Let me start with the data piece. If you have, and we've heard this early on, that someone put all their data in the cloud, all of a sudden the data egress charges were huge, all of a sudden they had to move their data, do they own their data, do they not own their data? I think agencies are better about that, mm -hmm. but the data, is, as we've talked about many times, is the key to all of this. If you can't make your data work for you, you got nothing. Are you seeing agencies taking better care of their data and understanding how, how to take better care of it? I am seeing much more thought go into that for the reasons you mentioned, um, and I see some changes coming in a couple of directions. One is I'm seeing some real focus, especially in the wake of some of the cybersecurity incidents we saw last year, about being able to store copies um, of data sort of offline using flash storage and other kinds of technologies so that if there is a ransomware attack or um, if, our, if there's a cyber attack of, of some nature or some kind of catastrophic climate event, that they're able to restore their environments in less than 30 days, right? And in some cases, if those kinds of events occur, it literally takes on average 23 to 30 days to rebuild those environments. If, if they're smart about backing up their data and using those kinds of technologies, they can get back up within hours. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing that as, as sort of one approach. 
Um, the other piece that I'm seeing is as you adopt open technology, you actually can keep the data resident where it is, and you can actually access that data just in time to, to say from an edge device out in, out in theater for, for DOD or down from a FEMA site in terms of disaster response. Um, the open cloud approach allows uh, agencies to actually deploy their applications out to the edge, but to be able to consume the data uh, where it resides. And I, I think that's the other architectural change that I've started to see. And I think that's so important as we've seen with the edge. We, a lot of more agencies, both civilian and DOD, are talking about that edge. And it's not just the NOAAs and National Weather Service mm -hmm. that have sensors out in the ocean or somewhere. But you're talking, you know, think about FDA and USDA and law enforcement. A lot of there's edge technology needed. So there was a concern for a long time, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that there was just the applications are too heavy, and then the cloud has made has is is if it's great, right to say lighten those applications because of the piece you mentioned about the data. Right, I think that's absolutely that spot on, and I think that's only going to accelerate. I mean, my favorite edge use cases are actually things like autonomous vehicles, which I think are only going to increase in importance as we go through, you know, coming decades and. You know, when you're thinking about an autonomous ship that needs to be able to read currents and understand weather patterns and use AI to make decisions about kind of where to go and to perform other kinds of, of, of functions, right? What it really needs to be able to do is to ingest data from all of these different kinds of sensors um, and to be able to process that in real time to execute an action. Things like latency really matter, right? So you need architectures that allow those kinds of systems to get the right data at the right time and move forward. Um, you know, that's just one example. But I think you're right. If you're thinking about putting sort of a, a, a cloud satellite out on a Humvee or a tank or, a, or another vehicle, you can't put in five racks onto the back of a Humvee, right? You need to be able to put that in a compact way onto, onto that, whatever that edge platform is, to make sure it's getting the data it needs, making sure it can send the data where it needs in, in a secure and trusted way. That's the future. And, and just to be clear, it's not even back on the back of a Humvee or a tank. It's also in a, in a police car or a, or an FBI agent's car. Or you pick you pick the absolutely area because they have they have the same need for the, to access data, to understand the data, and make critical decisions. So I think that's that's why I think this edge piece is, is being picked up by so many more agencies than just DoD. Great of course, point. Yeah. Of course, DoD's leading it yeah. because they always do. <laughs> but that's point. The other piece to the data security, <clears throat> let's take the last part of our discussion here and head down that path a little bit because I think when we first started talking about cloud more than a decade ago, a lot of it was around security. Oh, is it secure enough? We know about FedRAMP. If you want to talk about FedRAMP, we can. I don't think we need to. I think people, if, mm -hmm. if you don't understand what FedRAMP is, you can look it up. It's on the Google. But let's talk a little bit about why there's a more comfortability with security and how the new the new approaches to security and, and you know feel free to go down the zero trust path or, mm -hmm. or identity access management why that's really making people more agencies more comfortable with the cloud right i think there are a number of pieces to the security question i think first is that i think agencies sort of in in the wake of what we what we saw sort of last fall and, and this spring um, are, are realizing the importance of following the best practices and standards um, in the security space that have existed for some time but have not always been followed um, as well as they need to, right? So I think you mentioned identity access management. You mentioned uh, you know encryption of, of data at, in motion and at rest. Um, and you mentioned zero trust, right, and creating those kinds of processes. I think, I think the industry sort of understands what's needed to actually secure these systems. And I'm seeing with the creation of CISA and other kinds of organizations, much greater focus in on making sure that we are adhering to those best practices and standards. The other piece is really around monitoring and there's great you know, SIM tools and SOC, SOC services out there that can really do an amazing job at, at monitoring, um, detecting and resolving threats before they occur. And I just, I think we're gonna see a real surge in terms of government agencies taking advantage of those services out there um, to make sure that we're keeping our critical assets and, and information safe. One of the most exciting examples of this is something that DIS is doing, which is a cloud-based internet security tool, which is stopping the potential malware or, or virus from getting in, into an agency's network through a uh, web browser, which is a lot, a lot what's going on. 
when we when you talk to agencies about security, what questions do, you, do they still have about as it relates to the cloud and multi-cloud? I think the biggest challenge I hear them talk about is that the attack surface is so large and there is so much data. How can they make sense of that data to be able to detect and resolve a threat like you said before it occurs? And this is where I think there's some really interesting and exciting work going on in the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in terms of the ingestion of all of that kind of, of monitoring data in real time to help separate the wheat from the chaff and provide to the, to the SOC or the CISO real-time information about there's a million things happening out there. These are the three things you better focus on because these appear to be anomalies or these appear to be patterns that we know were part of a, a cyber pattern over in Singapore. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it's another area where the use of, of technology as an enabler, an AI technology as an enabler, um, r really helps you know, provide a better security posture. You brought up AI ML, let's go down that path, because <laughs> I think that's the other piece where agencies are really starting to understand the, the value of multi-cloud is the tools that come with it. And again, we can call it AI, you can call it machine learning, you can call it predictive analytics, or, or whatever. Is that the other trend maybe that we should make sure we highlight when we talk about hybrid cloud, that when you have these tools, because they can pull data from different clouds to run, and then you have a better view of what's really going on, whether it's in your network for security or just mission side. I think that's a great question. I think this is actually one area where there actually is differentiation between the different cloud service providers, the Microsofts, the IBMs, the, the AWSs, all have different approaches to sort of AI and a different set of services that are consumable through their clouds. So it's one place where it's not just sort of one common standard everywhere and, and which cloud you choose gives you the same. This is an area where if you want to take advantage of say, I'll be parochial Watson sort of analytics or IBM's cloud pack for data, right? It, it's resident in, in, in our cloud. AWS has some other great services that sit in its cloud. Um, and so that's where you may want to consume or put workloads in those places. The next generation in this strategy though is you know, something we call something called cloud satellite, where you can also take these elements and actually place them into another dedicated data center or a cloud. So that if you actually want to standardize on say AWS cloud, but you really want to take advantage of IBM's um, AI tools, you, know, you, can, you can deploy cloud satellite, which allows those services to then be resident in that other cloud and consumed as part of your workloads in that environment. Or you could do the same thing into a dedicated data center on the edge. Um, if you wanted to be, if you were over in theater or if you were at a USAID site, um, you know, over in Africa and you wanted to be able to consume certain services, you wouldn't have to build out a whole new cloud infrastructure over, over, over in Africa. You could actually deploy a lightweight version of that cloud to be able to consume some of those cloud services that you need. That, that's another, I think, growing trend in the, in the market. You know, you're not flying to their place and bringing in a whole package of uh, five and a quarter disks <laughs> and putting one in and taking one out, putting one in. Right. You're not doing that? No, right. sorry. I do miss those days, right? Yeah. <laughs> those are the good old days. Or, or the old mainframe punch cards, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, now you're dating me. You know. uh, Andrew, we're just about out of time. Uh, we have uh, a couple minutes left here, so let's bring us back around to the beginning of the conversation where we talked about the, the idea of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environment. The, the idea of, of ensuring you're optimizing your architecture, managing it effectively. What's the big takeaway from our conversation? What are one or two things that you think agencies really should, should consider moving forward? Because as we know no agencies at zero, no agencies at 100. They're always in, somewhere in the middle. For me, the biggest takeaway in the cloud market today is that I really firmly believe that the right answer for government agencies is to be able to take advantage of the multi-cloud environment. There's so many rich capabilities across the industry uh, and different environments are the best fit for different workloads and different mission priorities. If you accept that as a premise, the biggest challenge facing our IT organizations today is how do you secure that across that broader attack surface um, and how do you orchestrate the workloads across it? Right. So it's focusing in on multi-cloud management, cloud orchestration, and that common um, operating picture um, to be able to take advantage, to take full advantage uh, of that vast array of capability. I, I mean, I think, and for me, I think the, the open hybrid approach is going gonna, is gonna to win the day in terms of the strategy that, that agencies are going to deploy to meet those mission needs. 
And I think we're going to live in this hybrid world for quite a while. I don't mm -hmm. think agencies are getting rid of all their data centers, and I don't think they're going to ever go down to one cloud for all the reasons we've been talking about mm -hmm. today and throughout the cloud exchange. Right. Andrew, I really enjoyed our conversation. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. <laughs> so let me thank my guest. Andrew Fairbanks is the general manager for Federal at IBM Services. Andrew, thank you so much for taking the Thanks, time. Sir. I enjoyed it. I'm Jason Miller. Now let's rejoin the studio for more from the Cloud Exchange on Federal News Network.